Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank both of you for your service. Uh, I can only repeat to you what I have heard in talking and listening to people with expertise, and this is how they have kind of explained the Cold War coming to an end and where we are today and, and if we're on top of our game or if we're ahead of our game that basically the United States uh, in the 80s took the position to be very aggressive in some of the weapons we designed. Russia could not keep up with what we were doing, kind of forced them into a system, uh, a situation where they had to evaluate, could we defend ourselves against American with the superior weapons they've designed? That's what it was given to me in that, along those lines. Now, if you take it from the Cold War forward, uh, have we still stayed on top of our game? Uh, it sounds to me as if hypersonic weapons and other future weapons have been more advanced by other countries, such as China, even Russia coming back into the scene in a, high, in, in a real aggressive way, maybe North Korea to a certain extent. And are we going to be able to, to deter them from moving forward uh, because of our superiority, or are we going to be playing a defense catch-up? So whoever, however you can help me with that, understand it better. Let me start that okay. in terms of, uh, first, uh, I won't go back to the, that was a choice by China and Russia to develop those weapons, right? We certainly could have done that, and no, uh, we did not. I think that uh, their actions in many cases speak louder than what they tell us in terms of what their intentions sure. are. And again, this is a competition, right, just like any other military competition. And I am confident uh, that this nation has the ability to produce the capabilities we have to have, and for deterrence, uh, again, the basic equation hasn't changed. Can I deny you your aim or can I impose a cost on you that is greater than what you seek? I can do that if necessary. Admiral, I, I think in general both this, the evaluation was given to me about the Cold War and the end of the Cold War. Is that accurate? Did, did we were just so, we outpaced them so far that they had to come to realization they could not compete and defend themselves. Senator, what I would offer, I would break that into a conventional piece and a strategic deterrence okay. piece. And on the conventional side of the House, in general, I would say that that is in the main correct, right? Yes. And what we're able to do on the strategic deterrence side is hold strategic deterrence, right? The whole goal on strategic deterrence is for nothing to happen. Correct. And we were successfully able to do that. Right. So I would recharacterize it slightly in terms of a conventional force um, uh, uh, advantage that we achieve. General. Senator, what I would add to that, though, as you fast forward to today, what we do see is our adversaries really investing in some of that conventional capability um, that does have the ability to hold us at risk, and we have to, therefore, be able to defend against it. What I'm referring to, for example, is, with, for example, the SEV submarine that has very good capability that, that carries cruise missiles, some of the long-range aviation like the bombers. With we have USS West Virginia. I've been on it and spent <laughs> some time with them. I appreciate it. They do an excellent job. Sure. And so I, so I think from our perspective, we think a lot from the Cold War about the nuclear aspect and deterrence. I think as we reach today, we also have to factor in the conventional aspect of this and having peer sure. adversaries that have the capability to reach out, reach out to us at home in ways that we didn't have in the Cold War that we have to factor into our defense. My environment. final question would be basically you're looking 30 years down the road, at least 30 years down the road, for the weapon, uh, for the life of the weapons that we're, and, and the defense that we're doing with our triad. Are we looking... Uh, uh, at what their capabilities and where they're looking 30 years down the road to, and if they might be to the point to where they're advancing quicker, willing to make more sacrifices, spend more money to become an equal superpower. The one belt, one road, as far as I'm concerned, is China wants to be the only superpower left by 2050. I hope Americans understand that, and I hope we in Congress understand it. That's what I'm concerned about. And I'm determined in my life for my children, whatever I can do and whatever decision can prevent that from happening because this is the greatest country on earth. There's no doubt what, what, what their mission is, right, what China's mission is. Sir, not only do I agree, but I'll give you a quick example. Colombia is going to be in service until 2080, right? Uh, the Navy and the submarine force, and there's Air Force equivalents to this too, have long had very uh, 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 extensive programs that are looking 30 years down the road, and they're physics-based, right? They're not necessarily yeah. intel-based and looking at anything that could be developed into a threat so that we in parallel start working the countermeasure to that. And I have great confidence in those programs. They've served us well. And in my full time, I would just quickly say that that's why the NDS implementation with very clearly focuses on this great competition and the competition with China and in particular and Russia drives us to make sure we do invest in those right resources that will allow us to compete appropriately going into the future, Senator. Well, it's my uh, confidence in military leaders like yourself that give me the confidence for my children and grandchildren. Thank you.